It is a privilege and joy to welcome you all to the Herald Report YouTube ministry today. My name is Kutsa Ichikogor, I'm your host. We greet you wherever you are following us from, be it in the Solomon Island, it might be in Canada, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in America, wherever you are, in the Caribbean, or all over the world. God truly bless you and thank you for subscribing, encouraging friends and colleagues to subscribe to the Herald Report YouTube ministry as we continue to preach the present truth of our time. Today we've got a very special topic and the question which I'm asking in this topic, there are three questions which we're asking today. Have you been baptized? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Where is the evidence? May the Lord bless you as you follow us on this special message. Let's pray. Loving Father of mercy and compassion, on this special occasion, may your spirit fall afresh upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 3 from verse 1, this is an encounter with Nicodemus, Jesus with Nicodemus, the Bible says, there was a man of Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, no, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now listen, Nicodemus is saying, we know. How many people know about this? There was a discussion in the Sanhedrin, and they know very well they have evidence that Jesus is from God, but they don't want to believe that he is the master. Jesus could tell the actual problem which Nicodemus have, and Jesus decided not to beat about it, decided not to enter into argument with this Pharisee gentleman who was so educated, so rich, but he decided to address the real problem with Nicodemus. Verse 3, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very, very, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is discussing with Nicodemus. Nicodemus had come for arguments with Jesus. Nicodemus had come to find out some more information about Jesus Christ. But Jesus addressed the real problem with Nicodemus, the desire of Nicodemus to be saved. And then because his desire is to be saved, Jesus decided to lay the foundation of salvation. Until and unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. My brothers and sisters, Salvation is critical, but there is a step to salvation. There are quite a lot of steps as we're going to cover some time later on, but there is one critical step. Unless we are born of water and spirit, we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. The question is, what exactly does that mean? I want to go to the Desire of Ages, page 171, paragraph 1. It says, Nicodemus had come to the Lord thinking to enter into a discussion with him, but Jesus laid bare the foundation principle of the truth. So this is the foundation principle of truth. I'm a preacher of present truth. I'm a preacher of prophecy. I I enjoy doing that actually. However, I cannot isolate that with this critical thing. The principal truth, the foundation is being born again. The foundation is the change of heart. He said to Nicodemus, it is not theoretical knowledge you need so much a spiritual regeneration. When we learn about prophecy, when we learn about what is happening, when we learn about what is happening, this is all theoretical, my brothers and sisters, but when we are talking about the change of the heart, when we are talking about being led by the Spirit of God, when we are talking about living a life of Christ, this is the practical thing which Jesus wants all of us to have. Therefore, we need this spiritual regeneration. It says, you need not to have your curiosity satisfied, but to have a new heart. You must receive a new life from above before you can appreciate heavenly things. Until this change takes place, make all things new. It will result in no saving good for you to discuss with me my authority or my mission. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. It doesn't mean you may know about my mission. You may know about my authority. You may know about all these things. Yes, but listen, the most important thing is for you to change. My brothers and sisters, we will know about everything. We will understand many things. But until and unless there is a change in our heart, all these things means nothing. God has a problem with people who preach the gospel. They preach the gospel with their mouth, but their actions, they reflect a different thing altogether. My brothers and sisters, there is need for a change. There is need for regeneration of heart. Now, listen to Testimonies to Ministers, page 368, paragraph 1, addressing the same thing. Jesus virtually says to Nicodemus, 
to Nicodemus, it is not controversy that will help you your case. It is not controversy that will help your case. It is not argument that will bring light to the soul. I know that we love arguments. Some of us want to discuss, we want to have an understanding, we want to argue, we want to prove the points. Those things are not important, my brothers and sisters. They have got their place. In fact, let me actually rephrase it. Those things are important, but they have their place. When it comes to salvation, those things, die, they don't matter to salvation. You must have a new heart. This is key. You or you cannot descend the kingdom of heaven. It is not greater evidence that will bring you into the right position, but new purpose, new springs of action. This is the call of God, my brothers and sisters, to have a new heart. He says, you must be born again until this takes place, making all things new, the strongest evidences that could be presented would be useless. The want is in your heart. Everything must be changed or you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So what we are talking about, my brothers and sisters, is the heart. Has the heart been changed? The evidence of repentance is the heart. The evidence of salvation is the heart. Being born again is the change of the heart. The question is, why should a person be baptized? If you read from uh, Desire of Ages, page 172, paragraph 1, this is all quoting from the Bible, it says, by nature, the heart is evil, and who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. That's why Romans chapter 3, 23 says, For all have come of sin and come short of the glory of God. And this is Job 14, 4. No human invention can find a remedy for such for sinning soul. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Out of the heart proceeded evil, thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornication, tales, false witness, blasphemers. This is how evil the heart is. We're quoting from Romans chapter 8, verse 7, and Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. Jeremiah 79 says, the heart is desperately wicked. The heart is evil. There is nothing good in the heart. And the problem of the human being is not outside. The problem is within. And that which needs to change is the heart. And it says, the foundation of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works is keeping, in keeping the law, is attempting an impossibility. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. So we may know the law, like the Jews. We may keep the law, like the Jews. We may seek to please God, like the Jews, but it is of no use. We may do everything with our effort, my brothers and sisters. It's of no use. The change needs to happen from within, and it is the change of the heart. Now, Desire of Ages, page 172, paragraph 1, helps us to understand something profound. My brothers and sisters, Christianity is not, it says, the Christian life is not a modification of or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. The reason why we have a problem in church today, we have got Christians that have been panel-beated. Christians that has never changed. They have been modified. They lived in the world, they used to do good works, and we believe that in the church they can also do good works. Without the regeneration of the heart, their heart has not been changed. This is where the real challenge is. My brothers and sisters, humanity is unclean and there is need for a change. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, the Bible says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy wrecks, and we all do fed as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is nothing good in humanity. It's filthy. The works that we do is filthy. They don't end salvation. And David realized it and he cried in Psalm chapter 51, verse 10, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew the right spirit within me. And what Jesus is addressing to Nicodemus is actually addressing the change of the heart. He's addressing the regeneration of the spirit. And we learn from Ezekiel chapter 36 from verse 26. A new heart also I'll give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. A heart that has been transformed will not despise the law of God. 
a heart that has been transformed who obey the law of God, not for the sake of salvation, because, but because their heart has been transformed. The reason why there is so much argument today, the reason why people don't understand the law of God today, the reason why people disregard the law of God today, the problem is their heart. It's wickedness. It's the corrupt heart. It's the filthy heart. And Jesus has come to address the filthy heart so that out of the filthy heart, he can restore and regenerate and bring something new. And then their heart will be able to obey and keep the commandments of God. I want to ask you Christians, have you been baptized? Have you been baptized? If you are baptized, how come you are involved in so much corruption? If you are baptized, how much you lie so much? If you are baptized, how, how come that you commit so much adultery? You are in so much adultery. You are in drugs. You are in lying. You are in all kinds of foolish. Have you really been baptized? Honestly, this is a very simple question. I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand something from you guys. Have you been baptized? If you have been baptized, the baptism is a regeneration of the heart. It's not the modification of the outer, but it's a transformation from within. Then the things that you used to do, you don't do them anymore. The places that you used to go, you don't go them anymore. The things that you used to do, you don't do it anymore. But now the question is, where is the evidence that you have been baptized? Many of us, my brothers and sisters, we claim that we have been baptized when baptism has never happened at all. Because we are just as crude as we were before we met Christ. John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus went on to say, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound therefore, but cannot tell where it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, I want to explain this using Desire of Ages, page 173, paragraph 1. It says, While the wind is in itself, while, I will repeat again, while the wind is itself invisible, the prod produce, it produces effects that are seen and felt. So the work of the Holy Spirit upon the soul will reveal itself in, the, in every act of him who has felt its saving power. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humanity, and peace takes the place of anger, envy, and strife. Joy takes the place of sadness, and the continents reflect the light of heaven. I ask myself a question again. Have I been baptized? If I've been baptized, where is the evidence? Because it's very clear here that uh, envy will be renounced. Love of the humanity, peace takes place of anger, envy, strife. There will be joy, peace, happiness, goodness in my heart. And I will seek to do those things which give glory and honor to God. Have I been baptized? Have I been baptized by the water and the spirit? Yes, I was there. You, they were there. They witnessed your baptism by the water. You went, you were, but by the way, baptism only happens when there is a lot of water by immersion. If you have, they put a cross on you, you have not been baptized. If they sprinkled water on you, you have not been baptized. If they have put, if, if, they, if, if you have passed, if you have walked down the flag, you have not been baptized. If you were baptized as a baby, you have not been baptized. Baptism only happens when you believe and you make a decision and you'll be immersed in water once baptizo. That's what it means in Greek. So therefore, I'm asking a question again, my brothers and sisters, to those who claim to have been baptized. Have you been baptized with water and spirit? Let me actually focus on that. Let me actually go to the encounter, uh, Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan. John chapter 4. Ah, this is a very powerful story, my brothers and sisters. Follow it precisely. John chapter 4 from verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who is it that said unto thee, Give me to drink? Thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Say, thou hast nothing to draw with, and where would, and the world is deep from whence then is thou the living water? Listen to the argument, how it's progressing. Verse 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which give us the well, and drink the bed of himself and his children and his cattle? Of course, Jesus was the creator. Jesus is the creator of Jacob. He's much greater because before Jacob he was, he is the greater I am. Verse 18, Jesus answered and said unto him, Whoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drink of this water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him 
shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Jesus is promising that if you come to me, if you drink of me, then I will be in you. You will be a well, a spring of water that overflow. Jesus Christ who resides in the heart and the goodness of Jesus Christ will continue to be seen. But there is something very interesting in verse 15. Listen, Jesus said unto him, uh, the woman said unto him, Say, give me this water that I thirst ne not, neither come hither to draw. So the woman was keen to receive this water. Give me this water that I thirst not. But now listen to the, uh, the, 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 the response of Jesus. Jesus said unto him, Go call thy husband and come hither. Why should she go and call her husband? Why should Jesus say to him, Go and call your husband? Because the problem was with the behavior of this woman. The problem which made this woman not to drink water, it was because of her life. And Jesus was addressing the same problem which this lady had. Many of us were baptized before our sin problem was addressed. Many of us were baptized before we gave our hearts to Jesus Christ. Many of us were baptized before we actually committed our lives to Jesus Christ. Hence, we were not baptized, but just went into the water. We bathed and we just came out as exactly as we were. Now, Desire of Ages, page 187, paragraph 5, says, Jesus now abruptly turned the conversation before this soul could receive the gift he longed to bestow. He must be brought to recognize his sins and his Savior. My brothers and sisters, before you are baptized, you need to recognize your sin and the Savior. What actually means is this, before you are baptized, you need to recognize who you are. When you have recognized who you are, you recognize your challenge. And then you say, oh Lord, please, by thy grace and thy power, help me to deal with my challenge. Mm -hmm. The problem is, you are an adulterer. Jesus is talking to this woman. He did not use this word. And then he decided to say, go and call thy husband. By saying, go and call thy husband, he knew that he has touched the nerve of this lady. She was an adulterer. She had a fifth husband. Therefore, there was a problem that she needed to address and say, oh, thou art a prophet. The woman was very much surprised as Jesus began to open to her, her life. Not only did Jesus open to her life, but Jesus also helped her to find the solution. She found the Savior. It was on that juncture that Jesus actually said to her, listen, I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah you are looking for. And this is the time now the true worshippers of God should worship God in spirit and truth. For God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The question is, have I received the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Paul was uh, in Ephesus. He came to the disciples of John the Baptist in Acts chapter 19 verse 2. And the Bible says, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether they be any Holy Ghost. I'm asking a question, my brother. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you first believed? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you were baptized? If you have, where is the evidence? Acts of the Apostles, page 50, paragraph 1, it says, If all were willing, all will be filled with the Spirit. Wherever the need of the Holy Spirit is a matter of little thought of, there is sin, spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension and death. Wherever minor matters occupy the attention, the divine power which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church and which would bring all other blessings in its train is lacking, though offered in infinite plenitude. My brothers and sisters, the challenge we have is we focus on minor matters. We focus on the windows, on the carpets of the church, on all kinds of foolish things. And we forget to focus on major matters, the change of the heart. To be a Christian is one thing, but to be a child of God is another. The question is, how do you know you have the Holy Spirit? Where is the evidence? The Bible says in John chapter 14 from verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. If you love me, keep my commandments, and then I will give you another comforter. Verse 17, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, 
but you know him for he dwelleth with you and you shall be and shall be with you why because you keep my commandments and the gift is the holy spirit but let's take it from Acts chapter 5 verse 32 and we are his witnesses of these things and so is the, also the holy ghost whom god has given to them that obey him to those who obey god they will receive the holy spirit to those who obey god he writes his laws in their hearts to those who obey god he gives them the, the power of the holy spirit the question is, what should I do that I may receive the Holy Spirit? My brothers and sisters, this process is simple. Let's go through it. The first thing, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. God is faithful and truthful because he said, Ask and it shall be given to you. Remember the promise of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses. Uh, you shall be my witnesses unto you both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus has promised that, you know, if we believe in him, if we trust in him, if we walk in him, we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the question is, what should I do as a child of God? This is a basic Christianity, my brothers and sisters. Testimonies Ministers, page 547 says, It was by confession and forsaking of sin by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That's why on the day of Pentecost, my brothers and sisters, Peter said to the people, repent, turn from your sins. And then when you have done that, the time of refreshments will come. The time of refreshments he was referring to the Holy Spirit. The process is the same, my brothers and sisters, and the, the same process of the later rain is the same process of receiving the Holy Spirit, the early rain, that we may grow from point A to point B. He says, the same work only in a greater degree must be done today. What did they do? They confessed their sins. They forsook their sin. They looked for Jesus. They tried to understand the, the, the message of Jesus and they tried to live that message faithfully and truthfully. And by doing that, God in his mercy and power poured, Jesus in his mercy and power poured the Holy Spirit upon them. So therefore, what can I do to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? What can I do to receive the Holy Spirit? Yes, I've been baptized. Yes, I'm a member of the church. But is that good enough? No, it's not. Last day, page 192, paragraph 2, say, I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained victory over every disappointment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. We should therefore be drawing near and near to the Lord and be in a seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, this is a time to let go our sins. As we let go our sins, then Luke chapter 11, verse 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Why? Because they have surrendered to him. And you give them generously. Isaiah of Ages, page 672, paragraph 1 says, Christ has promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his church, and the promise belongs to us as much as to the first disciples, as Peter said on the day of Pentecost. But like the, every other promise, it is given on conditions. What is the condition? There are men who believe and profess to claim the Lord's promise. They talk about Christ and about the Holy Spirit, yet receive no benefits. Yes, you are very good in talking about the Holy Spirit. You can discuss, you can say all kinds of things, but the question is, has he come to you? If you received him. And then it says, they do not surrender the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agencies. If you surrender to Jesus, we cannot use the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is to use us. Through the Spirit, God works in his people to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's Philippians chapter 2, 13. But men will not submit to this. They want to manage themselves. This is why they do not receive the heavenly gift. Only to those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. The power of God awaits their demanded reception. This promised blessing, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in his train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ, and he is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. Yes, 
Today we may be baptized by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Today he may come in full measure. Today we may receive all the power. If we have confessed our sins, if we have surrendered to him, if we have given our hearts to him, it is left with us, my brothers and sisters, to surrender. Let me deal with two uh, individuals, as I close, who surrendered to the gift of the Holy Spirit. One was Joseph of Arimathea. One was Nicodemus. We have dealt with Nicodemus, but let's visit this again. As Jesus was crucified, there was great persecution in Jerusalem. But there was a gentleman called Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. He says in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 104, paragraph 2, the disciples had been afraid to show themselves openly as Christ followers, but Nicodemus and Joseph had come boldly to their end. Nicodemus and Joseph, they came boldly. At one point, Nicodemus came at night, but now it was no longer at night. He came during the day. The help of the rich, the help of these rich and honored men was greatly needed in that one hour of darkness. <laughs> Listen, these guys, number one, they were very rich. Number two, they were highly honored. They had been able to do for their dead master what it would have been impossible for the poor disciples to do. And their wealth and influence had protected them in a great measure from the malice of the priests and the rulers. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, there's something called influence. God did not only use the influence of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. The first thing is that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they were converted. They had the Spirit of God. They were moved by the Spirit of God. Now, because they were now instruments in the hands of God, God used their influence. God used their resources. God used their honor to, to, to expedite his work. It was because of their influence, their honor, their riches that made the work to be successful. My brothers and sisters, all those things, the influence, the riches, it was a gift from God, and God was just using his gifts through these men. Uh, how do you view the rich people? Do we despise them? Do we think they don't have the spirit of God? Do we think they are not being led by God? No. They are God as God. He is rich people. In the time of need, these are the people that will come in forefront. God has politicians. In the time of need, the politicians will be in the forefront. They will use their influence. They will use their wealth to ensure that the work of God has progressed. Now, let's go further. He says, uh, uh, now when the Jews were trying to destroy the infant, infant church, Nicodemus came forward in its defense. The same Nicodemus who came by night. Now he has been transformed. He has used his riches. He's the one who buried Jesus Christ. Now he has come to the defense of the church, no longer conscious and questioning. He encouraged the faith of the disciples and used his wealth in helping to sustain the church in Jerusalem and in advancing the work of the gospel. Those who in, in other days had paid him reverence now scorned and persecuted him, and he became poor in this world's goods, yet he faltered not in the defense of his faith. My brothers and sisters, those rich people, when God visits them, when they have been converted, they will be pillars of the church of God. Those politicians, when they have been converted, there will be pillars like Nicodemus in the church of God. Those influential people, when they have been converted, when their heart has been changed, my brothers and sisters, they will do wonders in the work of God. The question I ask myself is, have I been baptized? Have I received the Holy Spirit? And where is the evidence? Have I been baptized? Have you been baptized? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Where is the evidence? God is calling us, my brothers and sisters, to give all for him, that our sins may be washed. I want to end with a song by Elisha H. Hoffman in 1878. The question, the song is, are you washed? The singer say, have you been to Jesus for a cleansing power? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And say, are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? But the last stanza said, 
lay aside the garment that is stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There is a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. My brothers and sisters, when we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, our life will be changed. Our lives will be transformed and will become the children of God. I ask this simple question. Have I been baptized? If I have been baptized, where is the evidence? Have I been baptized with the Holy Spirit? If not, this is the day of transformation. This is the day of change. May the Lord help us that we may be true children. This only happens when we have taken the first step. Be baptized. That your heart may be, be transformed. Let your heart be changed. And as evidence of the change that is happening, we can go into the watery grave. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father, for the time that you have given us. There are people like Nicodemus, like the women of Samaria. They accepted you and their lives were transformed. Even us, dear Lord, today, Lord, meet us at our point of need. Transform our hearts and help us to be your children. Oh Lord, be merciful to us in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord truly bless us as we think and contemplate about this message. Once more, I encourage you to share this message and let's remember that it is our character that will take to heaven. God bless us as we seek to be baptized by the water and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen.